No, it doesn't. So. But welcome again. I'm Dr. Dave Newton, in case you're watching on the video for the first time. And uh, we're here at Calvary Chapel, and we're doing a study every Monday night, Figure It Out. Currently, we're in uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And we're borrowing a little phrase from Peter in our fall study where he talked about the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Make careful search and inquiry, seeking to know the person or time that the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, you're probably happy to see part four up here because tonight's the last part of covering everything related to heaven. Uh, so we got it in in four nights. Um, so we'll figure out, finish up tonight with Revelation chapter four and five to go along with our Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah that we've looked at before. And then we'll also take a quick little look into Acts chapter 9 and a little commentary from 2 Corinthians 12 where Peter, uh, the apostle uh, Paul goes ahead and comments on his uh, personal experience uh, in the heavenly realm. So, uh, quick review, just to kind of take the first three weeks. This is where you should be. I want to get you to a place where you feel... Uh, conversant. You feel like you can talk about this without maybe having the notes in front of you. If somebody asks you about, you know, some of these different beings and what's going on in the heavenly realm. And so, so far we've been through Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, Ezekiel 28, and Jeremiah chapter 26. And so we've talked about the idea of the hemline identity, where it says, uh, I saw the Lord and the, the train of his robe filled the temple. And we looked at that and what that term really means. Uh, there is a true temple in heaven. The tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem were just models of that. Uh, we've talked about seraphim and uh, cherubim and the idea of wings. And uh, we'll look a little more tonight at the definition of that term that although it can mean uh, a typical wing of a bird, uh, it also can be just opening up a, a large uh, coat or a cape or a tunic and just holding it up on the sides and creating kind of a, a big effect there. But we do see the same term, fiery, brazen, burnished, bronze, uh, flaming, uh, when we think about the seraph and the cherub. And then the ophanim and the galgalim, which are also dealing with uh, these kind of de these deals of wheels, spinning vortex, gyroscopes, whatever. We do see the faces of the lion, the ox, the man, the eagle. We took a look at the throne, the majesty, these precious stones that are reflecting uh, the expanse overhead of the throne which is like crystal, or also interpreted, uh, the term can either be emerald or a rainbow. Uh, there's a cloud or a fire signifying the presence of God in his temple in heaven. Every time there's speaking going on, it's a voice like waters and many thunders and deep, deep kind of rushing. It must have been very loud. And then uh, we talked a lot about light and translucence, the idea of lighting and stars and lightning. And uh, we took a look at the Latin term for luxfer, which is where we get our term Lucifer. And then we looked at uh, Satan, uh, which is basically just an accuser. That's what it means, or an adversary. Uh, it's a legal term in the uh, Hebrew there. And uh, the morning star. And then the idea that agalos are simply just messengers. And obviously the beings in heaven uh, that were, were these ornate ones and so forth, they, they are not just regular agalos. Uh, they're, they're permanently in heaven. Uh, providing uh, worship to the Lord and so forth. Um, we also took a look at defining the seraph and the cherub, and that they're fiery, brazen, or burnished. Both words mean the same thing. Uh, always remember, uh, there's no passage anywhere where you'll read about uh, the seraphim were here, the cherubim were over here, the zoa were over here, and the elders were over here, and the open. It's not as if there's descriptions and they're all in the same scene. Does that make sense? You'll hear one guy use the term when he wrote it down. He used seraph, which is the fiery, brazen, uh, burnished. It's the same, similar term to cherub, but they're not in the same passages. So, and then when you get to the New Testament, we see zoa for living beings. We're going to see that tonight. We don't hear about the zoa and the cherub, or the zoa and the seraph. It's just the zoa. And zoa means life or living being. And, um, and then when you see tonight that the zoa have four faces, we're going to say, wait a minute, I've seen them before. That's the seraph and that's the cherub. And I think we'll see tonight, I have a chart at the end where we're going to take a look at all the different passages across the top, the key players down the side, and compare them side by side. I think it'll help put it all in order for you. Um, and I think everybody is over the fact that there are no little uh, chubby children with little wings like we saw in the, uh, in the Renaissance paintings and so forth. 
Uh, Lucifer is a cherub. He's a, he's a cherub, uh, singular. He was created, covered in precious stones, translucent light. We looked at that in Ezekiel 28. Uh, he shows up in Genesis 3 as the Nachosh, or the Nachesh, and he's a shining one, um, translated as a serpent, uh, same term. Uh, John 3, 14, uh, we hear about as Moses lifted up the seraph, the brazen serpent in the wilderness. So there's that term again, the seraph or the seraphim is plural. Numbers chapter 21, verse 8 is the exact account where Moses does make the bronze seraph, puts it up on the pole. That's the actual term used in the Hebrew. And uh, John uses that in his gospel as well, that it's that brazen serpent, uh, which is, again has, has interesting uh, translation. And think about it, there's a lot of words here in the United States in our English language that, my goodness, you know, if you're trying to learn English, uh, think of all the ways that you can pronounce things and how there's a word for this and there's a word for there's five different words for going for a, a hike on the mountain or the hill or the hillside. I mean, there's so many things. So uh, the Ofan and the Galgal are these more, they're wheels, they are distinct. You will see them in the same scene uh, because then the Kerub are at the base of the throne and between them is the Ofen or the Galgalim. And so they are in the same, so they aren't confused with, uh, uh, with the same beings. And of course that constant, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle face. So tonight we're gonna add in and fold in Revelation chapter four and five. And we're gonna hear about, uh, in the Greek, the term the Zoa. And Zoa simply means, it can mean life, it can mean living, it can mean alive, it can mean a living being. And um, interestingly enough, a little spoiler alert, as we go into them tonight, the Zoa have, guess what, four faces. A man, an ox, uh, an eagle. So it's gonna be the same as we've seen. And uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, never have both the Seraph and the Karub in, in the same scene. It's like they're both in there. Uh, you will read, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of scholars out there who have created there's a whole hierarchy. They either call it the eight stages of angels or the 10 stages of angels. And they've got this whole hierarchy they've created. As I've said before, that's just man's attempt to kind of create that. Um, but the real evidence as you go into the word is that there are not eight or 10 different kinds of angels and stages. Um, there are angels, they're messengers, agalos in the Greek. And then there are these living beings in the heavenly realm. And that's really all there are. And so we'll see that tonight. And uh, again, we don't see, even in Revelation 4 and 5, we don't actually see any mention of seraph or cherub. So there's no cherubim or there's no seraphim in John's interpretation. But what he comes out with in writing in Greek, he says, oh, I saw the zoa. And these are these living beings. And guess what? They have four faces just like we've seen with the others, okay? So John is on Patmos. He's been, uh, he's the only surviving uh, original uh, apostles, uh, the disciples of Jesus. Uh, he's one of the sons of Zebedee, so there's John Bar Zebedee and James Bar Zebedee. Uh, Jesus called them uh, the sons of thunder because they always were trying to call down uh, fire and brimstone like the Old Testament on any village that wouldn't treat them well when they were leaving. And uh, at this time, it's the early 90s, Domitian is the emperor. Uh, John's literally the only remaining apostle. He's probably in his early 90s, born right around uh, 1 AD or 1 BC, kind of a contemporary of Jesus. Um, it's about 93 to 96 AD. He's on Patmos, which is just off the west coast of Turkey, as we see it today. Uh, and it's a literal place and a literal time. And uh, some of your, your, your Bibles might say, uh, we did this in the Revelation study in detail, but it'll say, uh, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and a lot of interpreters just say, oh, it was Sunday morning and he was in the Spirit. Um, they didn't even ca start calling it the Lord's Day until the third or fourth century. Uh, and, and so the, the correct interpretation in the Greek there, he says, I was transported in the Spirit to the day of the Lord. Okay, that's what he's saying. Okay, so whenever you read that in your scriptures, he's, he's not saying, oh, Sunday morning, the Lord's Day, and I was praying just before I went to Calvary and got my coffee and donuts, okay? No, he says, I was in the Spirit, and I was transported to the day of the Lord. He's literally taken out of physical time and space, and he gets to see everything from the perspective that the Lord sees, and he's outside of time. So John now views from God's extratemporal perspective, 
He's going to see Earth's past, his own past and Earth's past. He's going to see things going on very contemporary to him. And he's going to also see things that are still future from his perspective, some of which are still future for our perspective. Uh, remember, heaven, capital H, is different than in the Greek. It's called the Oranos, which is just kind of the uh, looking up at the stars and the moon and the Milky Way and the galaxies. And that's the, the second heaven up above the atmosphere. Uh, heaven, capital H, is God's domain. It is not within our universe. It's not as if you go out to Saturn, make a left, and head to a certain place, you'll find heaven. Okay? It, the Lord spoke the entire universe into being, and he did it from outside the time space uh, that we have in terms of molecules and, uh, and atoms that we are composed of. Uh, so he's there. It's, it's not an apparition. It's not a dream. He's actually transported out to the day of the Lord, and he gets the Lord lets him see a, an incredible perspective, not only of earth events, but also of heaven. And uh, if you look and do a study, uh, Chuck Missler used to say that um, in the 404 verses that are in Revelation, there are almost 800 references to the Old Testament in 400 verses. I mean, you can do the math there. That's an average of like two per verse. And some of these verses have three or four in them at a time. Uh, the other thing I've done is, I did this a long time ago, but went through and just looked at all the times that John says, I saw, he showed me, I heard, I looked and beheld. Over 70 times in the book of Revelation, he's saying, I saw this, I looked and saw that, I heard this. So he's actually there and experiencing this. Uh, we have no idea how long it actually was. I mean, he's on Patmos. He could have just been sitting in the back of the cave. Uh, there's really no place to go. It always reminds me a little bit of, do you ever see the movie Papillon with uh, Dustin Hoffman and, uh, and Steve McQueen? And they're on that little island. And essentially, they don't even bother with having chains or guards or anything because there's nowhere to go. You can't get off the island. And that's what Patmos is like. There's, there's nowhere to go. The currents around it and the, the way the waters are. So he's there. Uh, he's been uh, put there in exile and uh, will be released after Domitian's death. But uh, he could have been, you know, an afternoon, just with his eyes closed, just sitting somewhere and, and seeing what, what could have felt to him like four or five months' worth of revelation. Uh, could have been 20 minutes that he had his eyes closed. We'll see tonight that uh, Saul of Tarsus was sitting in the house of Judas on Straight Street in Damascus, for three days in this back room, taking no food, no water, he had what appeared to be, when it came off, looked like fish scales had been on his eyes. And we're told that in that amount of time, the Lord discipled him to become his 12th apostle. Uh, so think about, again, when you're transported out of earth time, I always remind people of C.S. Lewis capturing that in his Narnia Chronicles, especially as the kids go through the wardrobe they grow up to be adults and are kings and princes and princesses and queens. And then they come back and they see the lamppost as adults. They go back through the back of the wardrobe. They step out and they're kids again. And the nanny comes in and says, let's go, everybody. Time for dinner. And they go, how long were we gone? And she goes, what are you talking about? And it's literally just, it felt like a second in earth time. And so that helps to um, capture that idea that there's no time once you exit the temporal realm. The true temple in heaven, uh, the models that we have for that are the, the wilderness tabernacle and also the Jerusalem temples. The first one uh, constructed by Solomon and torn down by the Babylonians. Second rebuilt temple by Zerubbabel uh, after Cyrus gave them, uh, after the 70 years of captivity, they go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. And then, of course, Herod buying into this new title that he purchased called King of the Jews, which the Roman Senate gave him with a lot of money. He also put a lot of money into adding on to that second temple, and that's why it's often uh, referred to as Herod's temple. Uh, but those are models of the earthly temple. The, the, those plans were given in Second Chronicles to uh, David and all his workmanship and craftsmen to, to model it exactly as the Lord described it. You can even go back to what Moses put down in Exodus about how the tabernacle should be constructed with the outer court, the inner court, the brazen altar, the altar of incense, table of showbread, the seven gold lampstand, the holy place, the holy of holies, the veil. Everything is all symbolic of what's going on in heaven for real. And so John, 
Uh, I, I'm in the camp that uh, Dave Hunt always said, which was chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation, says that uh, meta, tauta, after these things, what's, what's going on before then? Let's see if how many of you remember from Revelation. It was the seven letters going on in chapters 2 and 3. After those letters are done, it's as if uh, he's going to be going into and seeing what it's like at the harpazo. Uh, he gets to see what you and I will see at that very same instant. Think about that. Our perspective is we still think of everything as linear time. It's still to come. Uh, he's already outside of time. Saw us, comes back into the 90s AD, and yet we, we, don't, we aren't even born yet on this earth timeline. That'll keep you up at night, okay? Uh, and then we're going to take a look tonight at Revelation 5, verse 9 and verse 11, because we hear that term, John sees in front of the throne every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, worshiping at the, and the Greek word is the thronos, and we get our English word throne. That's a pretty nice, easy one. And um, that's you, me, everybody who's at the marriage of the bridegroom and the bride. And uh, here's the one I, I, I think is interesting for you. Look down at the bottom here. The Greek word, he says, is that how many are there in verse 11? He says it's, uh, the Greek word is myrias. And myrias just means you can't, you can't count them. It's too many. It's innumerable. Think about that. John, John takes a look at the crowds in front of the throne. I, mean, I can't even imagine what that would be like. I don't know if he had a chance to do like a helicopter flyover of it, or he's looking from a distance somehow. We don't know. But he says, I looked, and behold, there were myrias in the Greek, and then see the other word that comes in, in uh, Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, is at the bottom here, is the term kilios. And kilios in the Greek is where we get our term kilo. And kilo is a thousand. So a kilogram, a kilometer, right? And so a thousand grams, a thousand meters. Kilo is a thousand. That's the Greek word for the number 1,000, is kilo or kilios. So the term, he says, you know how many people I saw? I saw myrias kilios. Innumerable thousands. That's the best he could come up with. I don't think they knew a lot about big, big, big numbers in the first century AD. And so for him to come up with, you know, in, this, in, the, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I saw Myrias Kilias. It was too many to count, and of those, there were like thousands of those. That's how many there were. And isn't that encouraging to think that uh, it's not like there's 1,500 people who are saved in, at the throne uh, for the marriage? I mean, it's, it's billions, and, and he sees it, and he just says, it must have been mind-blowing to get a view of that. Myrias Kilios, okay? Everybody got a little Greek lesson for tonight, okay? Being transported, the harpazo, to the day of the Lord. There are many Old Testament references of this. Now, we've covered the harpazo in great detail in Daniel. We did it very much detail in uh, a lot in Romans and certainly in Revelation, but, uh, and of course, the main two passages you always go to are 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 14. Those are the two places you can read about the harpazo, and the term is actually used there. Uh, but the Old Testament references are interesting. I have uh, five that I like to look at. We'll look at four of them right now. Um, Psalm 27.5. Uh, in these passages, when you look on the screen, you're going to see something in kind of dark red, and that's going to point you to it's, you're being taken out before the day of the Lord, judgment, the vengeance of the Lord, the wrath of God, they're all going to be in the red. And then the caught up or being taken out, symbolic or an inference about the harpazo, you'll see it in the, uh, which I always use for the Greek, is in the uh, gold there. So look at Psalm 27.5. On the day of trouble, he will do what? He's going to conceal me. The, the term there in the Hebrew is to either uh, hide me away or give me some refuge. Isn't that cool? When the day of the Lord comes, this is David prophesying, he's going to give me some refuge in his tabernacle. Oh, not the, what, the one in the wilderness? No, that was, already, that was already gone. In his real tabernacle, he's going to hide me in the secret place of his dwelling. So I believe that's a wonderful allusion and prophetic statement about the harpazo. A second one comes from Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. Notice again what we've got here. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth who practice his commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility, and perhaps then you will remain, what? Hidden or in his refuge. When? On the day of the Lord's great anger. 
So here you go. Harpazo out before the beginning of the tribulation, before that last seven-year period, that last Shabua. So here again, confirms what's in uh, Psalm 27, 5, and then Zephaniah 2, verse 3. The third one comes from one of our uh, prophets that we're studying, Isaiah. We haven't gotten to chapter 26 yet, but verse 21 in chapter 26 says this, come up, my people. That's literally what it means. Like, it'd be, it'd be one thing to say come, but it's literally saying, hey, come up, my people. It has a definite sound like the harpazo, right? Coming up, being snatched away. Enter your rooms, close your doors behind you, find refuge. There's that term again in the Hebrew. For a little while until what? The indignation runs its course. So all these three verses from the Old Testament all allude to the fact that there's going to be a time when those who are the Lord's are going to be given refuge. They're going to be given transport to come. Uh, and they're going to be missing what? They're going to be missing the day of trouble, the day of the Lord's great anger, the indignation. All sounds like the tribulation to me. My other favorite one to include in this is Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. We're reading through the lineage of the patriarchs, and we get to our buddy Enoch. And it says, Enoch walked with God, and then he was not, for God took him. And there's no Greek word there uh, that's harpazo, but it's a, it's a Hebrew word that means he basically just snatched him away. It's that same term. So think about that. Enoch walked with God, and then he was gone. He never died. And he was basically snatched, okay, taken away. And where you can get a nice confirmation on that is from Jesus' brother Jude, writes a little book in the New Testament. It's only one chapter. But verse 14 of Jude says this, that before the flood, which is what? Back in the red again. That's what? The Lord's judgment, a type that took place in the flood. Before the flood, before the judgment, Enoch was preaching, quote, Lord, come with your myriads of holy ones, unquote. There's that term again. And um, what, what is the guy in the Old Testament, prior to the flood, preaching, Lord, come with your myriads? I mean, it's really a wonderful prophetic allusion forward to the future at the second coming of Jesus and, and the idea of the rapture. Because always remember, wonderful type, if we had time to study in detail, is that the judgment that the Lord's bringing on the earth with the flood, there are two types going on, well, three. There's those who perish in the flood, and that's the Lord's judgment. But there are two. One is Enoch as a type of the church. He's harpazoed out. He's taken out before the judgment comes. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, the eight, they are not harpazoed out. They are what? Protected in the ark. Ark just means a box. They're protected, and they actually go through the judgment, but they're unharmed. They're protected during that time. And those are the two types we see in the tribulation. The church taken out beforehand, and Israel actually goes through the tribulation, and the Lord uses that to draw them to him. So, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. It's a very short chapter. I know I'm looking out, I see many of you were here for the Revelation study when we did that. Can you believe that was two and a half years ago? Wow. So, um, Right at verse 1, of course, is the meta tauta in the Greek, after these things. And uh, there's a statement, come up here. And so John is transported. He is literally harpazoed. We get a chance to see that. And I put the passages up here, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, the one we just looked at in Isaiah, Zephaniah, Psalm 27, Genesis 5. And then I also put on the end here, don't forget, it's not an Old Testament passage, but John 14. Jesus makes a statement, um, in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would tell you so, and uh, I have to leave so that I can do what? Go and prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. And that, again, is another wonderful statement, uh, clearly talking about the harpazo. He's going to come for his church and take them. And uh, there are some good books I can put out some references maybe next time, uh, some wonderful uh, Christian rabbis over the last 75 years or so, uh, two books I really like, uh, have written about the Jewish wedding process and how it has such an incredible alignment with everything going on about uh, the bride and the bridegroom. The bridegroom's at, at, at uh, her place. Uh, 
the, the proposal, there's the betrothal period. And then after the betrothal, there's the down payment. A price has to be paid. Think about that. Jesus paid the price. Uh, then he goes and goes to his father's house, and she has to do what? Just wait for him to be ready. And when he's at his father's house, he's preparing a place for her. And then he comes back without any warning, because the whole fun is to come and surprise her when she's not ready for it. And so he then comes and swoops her up when she's on a day when she's not ready. There's all these wonderful parallels. I'll, I'll give you some references if you'd like to see those. I'll stick them in the next email. But now we see this thing in Revelation 4 as you read it. So it's not many verses. If you just look at your Bibles, you can kind of go through that. But um, around the throne, John sees 24 elders. And tonight, I'm going to make sure that you leave here tonight feeling comfortable with who they are. Uh, the vast majority of scholars, theologians, pastors, everybody, they get to the elders and they just kind of go, well, we don't really know who they are, or they, they make a couple of statements, but there's a lot of problems with some of those. I think tonight I'll help you. I want to I finish up heaven by feeling like you know who the seraph are, who the cherub are, the ophanim and the galgalim and, and those wheels, uh, the throne, the elders, and the lamb and the title deed, and what John saw, and what Isaiah saw, and what Ezekiel saw. So, um, who are these elders? Well, uh, one thing we see about them, here's some of your hints. You can start writing these little hints down if you'd like. They're in white garments. Okay, so we're going to see a lot of believers who are in white garments after we've been redeemed. Okay? Um, they're in gold crowns. Crowns typically mean you're doing some kind of ruling. You have some kind of office to handle. Uh, John talks about, if you look down at your Bibles in, in, uh, in Revelation 4, there's a lot of lightning, thunder from the throne. Uh, he sees the seven lamps before the throne. Remember, Jesus is walking amidst the seven gold lampstands. I always love that imagery because in the, temper, in the tabernacle and in the temple, the seven gold lampstand was just something that they made. They covered it with gold. They stood it there and they lit it. And I'm telling you right now, that was not even close to what John saw, the seven gold lamps stand, that, that, that Jesus walking among the seven gold lamps, which are the spirits of the seven churches. I mean, that's really incredible. And um, John 1.14, John is really quick to remind us. The word becomes, the logos becomes flesh, and he tabernacles among us. Boy, what a wonderful way to understand the term tabernacle. Remember when we saw a couple weeks back how the Israelites camped and the tabernacle was in the center so the Lord's presence was right there in the middle? That's incredible because that's what he does. He tabernacles with us. And you're going to see in the millennium kingdom, what's he going to do? Tabernacle with us here on this planet. He's going to rule from David's throne in Jerusalem. And even after this earth is done and the Heavens are rolled up the, like a scroll, right? The, uh, the universe is rolled up like a scroll. The elements melt with intense heat. He said, you know, John says, I looked and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Not a new heaven for God, but a new oranos, a new covering of all these celestial bodies. And he sees a new earth. And if this one was pretty good, can you imagine what the new one is like? And then he also sees there was an old Jerusalem. It was a city, right, right there in, in Judea. But he sees the new Jerusalem, and we went through that in the Revelation study, the incredible detail of what that place looks like. And, um, and what does he say? He says, there's no longer any need for any sun or moon because the lamp of the Lord is our light. The lamb becomes our light. And that he then tabernacles with mankind. He's going to dwell with us. We don't go to heaven to dwell with him. He, through the Son, Jesus is going to dwell with us for eternity. And um, verses tw uh, chapter 21 and 22 of Revelation, the lamb is going to tabernacle among mankind. You can read about that. We did that in the Revelation study. That's really exciting. We also saw in Revelation 4, if you look down at your passage and read, read through a little bit, you'll see a crystal glassy sea that's right before the throne. Again, just picture a, a first century guy seeing whatever it is he saw, and he just said, it looked like, translucent glass, like crystal, just in front of the throne. And then there are these myrios kilios, you know, more than I could ever count times a thousand, standing before the throne. I mean, it's amazing. And this term thronos comes up again. The elders are on thronos, and there is he who sits on the throne. 
Um, and then we get this term. Now, here's our new term, the Zoa. And there's many Bible commentaries who say, oh, let's go through all the, the categories of angels. There's regular angels, there's uh, named angels, there's archangels, then there's seraphim. Above them is the cherubim. Above them are the ophanim and then the galgalim. And then above them are the zoa. And, and as if they're, you know, there isn't a single scene in anywhere in the Bible where the zoa, the seraphim, and the cherubim are in the same scene together. But you'll see in my chart tonight at the end that in the different ways that these different writers wrote about it, they described them all exactly the same, just using a different term. I mean, they were literally just blown away at the fact that, look at these living beings. Oh, my gosh. And notice, <laughs> lion, calf, man, and eagle is going to come up again. You can see that in, in Revelation 4. And uh, once again, they have this, you know, the perception, even as Ezekiel and as, uh, and as Isaiah did, uh, it seems that they have eyes all over as they lift open their garment or they spread up their wings. Uh, so interesting. And here's what's really nice. Every time there's a response to the praise and whatever's going on, uh, the elders are the ones who fall down on their knees. So no one's worshiping the elders. Make a, make a note to yourself. No one worships the elders. They are on thrones. They have crowns and they're ruling. They're in white garments. But they fall down in front of the throne and they take their crowns and whether they cast them down because they recognize that we're here to worship the Lord. And yet they have some kind of ruling going on. We'll get to that in a moment. And they say what? You are worthy. You are the only one worthy to be worshipped because you created all things and by you everything exists. Now most important is Revelation chapter 5. Let's take a look at that now. Just switch over one more chapter. And this we covered in detail in our Revelation study. But as you, as you roll through that, it's a short chapter again. But uh, it's probably, as Dave Hunt used to say, the most important real estate transaction in the history of the universe. Okay? There's one on the throne holding the title deed of the earth, and it's been sealed as it should be. The title deed needs to be redeemed by a kinsman redeemer, one who is able to do what? Pay the price to redeem it. It's been forfeited by Adam. It's going to be reclaimed by, we'll see in a moment, the second Adam, as he's referred to by Saul. Romans 5, 12 through 21. Sin entered the world by one man, and so death reigned through Adam. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, early on, it talks about there was a first Adam, but the second Adam is the one who was able to do what the first one could not. He can redeem what was forfeited. And he says, uh, John says, I was weeping because I thought to myself, who, who is possibly able to go up and take the title deed from him who sits on the throne and open it? Someone has to be able to be what? The kinsman redeemer who's worthy to take the penalty and to have paid the price. And we see a foreshadow of that in the book of Ruth, right? With uh, who our buddy Boaz as he redeems Ruth and Naomi. And so he says, I looked, and behold, I saw a lamb as if slain. So the elders and the alive ones, the Zoa, sing that the lamb is worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. And then we read, the lamb purchased or paid for everybody. Those myrios kilios that he saw. Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. You can go back through the Revelation notes we took a long time when we went through that study to actually drill down on what those four terms mean. Some have to do with ethnicity, some have to do with a nation, um, but everybody. And the term there, once again, I love it, it's myriads, same as we see uh, throughout uh, the prophecy of Enoch. And they say, worthy is the lamb to receive power and wisdom, riches, might, honor, glory, blessing. Whew. Really exciting. And here's the elders again. When they hear all that, they say amen. What does amen mean? Do you remember? So be it. Right? I affirm that. Amen. So who are these guys? Well, a couple little things come up. One is, uh, option A is, some say, well, there were 24 courses of the priests. Zacharias was of the course of Abijah. And remember, he was in the temple serving. There were 24 courses. You can read about those in Second Chronicles. And uh, maybe they think that these are, you know, some of the priests uh, I'll shoot that one down just because there's no need for priests any longer, right? 
Who's our one high priest right now? Jesus Christ. He's paved the way. He's, he's not only our great high priest, he's also the sacrificial lamb. And there's no need any longer for any more sacrifices. Saul the Pharisee makes very clear in the book of Hebrews that there's one sacrifice once for all. There's no longer any need. And he even says those sacrifices of bulls and rams and sheep and everything, and they could never actually cover your sin. They could only symbolically show that you were sorry for your sin. Uh, a, another option is the 24 divisions of the singers. Uh, we don't actually see them singing or anything like that, but some, some people bring this up. They're also in Second Chronicles. Some say, oh, you know what you do? You add up the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes, and you get the 24. So wouldn't that be cool that the ruling elders, you got the Old Testament and the New Testament. I've read a lot of those commentaries. They're interesting. But um, the problem with that is that... Uh, the scene that they're looking at at this time is a scene of the marriage, and Israel is most of Israel is still on the planet Earth going through the tribulation. And so, interesting. But option D, it could be that they're the church, clothed in white. In fact, we're told Jesus reigns with his church. We're going to reign with him, we're told that. And interestingly, it says they're holding bowls, and the bowls have an incense coming out, which are the prayers of the saints. These aren't the saints that were, you know, beatified, uh, you know, by the, uh, the Roman church or something. This is anybody who's, who's sanctified. So I, like D, is starting to lean us in the direction of maybe they are simply just representative of, of you and I, of those who are redeemed, who are going to rule and reign with Jesus. We'll get into this in a moment, a little more detail. Um, and in fact, one of the elders has to explain to John that the lamb is the one who's worthy. It's as if he understands this is the, 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 the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is Jesus who died on my behalf. Um, interestingly, when we look at who they are, there it is in the Greek, and if you transliterate that directly over, they are presbyteros. So now you know that the elders are Presbyterians, okay? Um, they're not Congregationalists or Methodists or Anglican, okay? They're all Presbyterians. No, but that's where Presbyterian comes from. Uh, we think of like the Episcopal Church is Episcopal. Episcopos is the Greek term for an overseer, episcopa. And so the episcopal church had a, it was founded by having overseers who would oversee the church. The Presbyterian church was started by what were called presbyteros, which is a Greek term. And presbyteros uh, are used to designate elders. It's the term translated in your New Testament when you read like 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. You're reading about elders. You're reading about presbyteros. And that means somebody who is an elder and the qualifications for an elder. So I, I like the fact that if they're actually called elders, they're called presbyteros, that's the same term all used throughout what? The New Testament church for those who have leadership positions in the church. That's who these are. They're not angels. There's nothing mentioned about them being agalos or messengers. Um, the 24 courses of men serving as priests, the 24 divisions, we saw those. The 12 apostles plus the 12 tribes. Um, the church is always clothed in white. In fact, we're told in Revelation 3 that Sardis has kept its garments white, hasn't allowed them to become dirty or to become uh, soiled by the world. Uh, the crowns, there are five crowns. We'll look at those on the next slide in detail, but I've covered these before in prior studies. In the New Testament, you can read about five different crowns. The crown of life, the incorruptible crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, and the crown of exaltation. And those are all very different words and uh, we'll see what they look like in a moment. Um, we do know that Jesus reigns with his church. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, we are going to be what? Seated with him in a ruling position, uh, both in his millennial kingdom and afterwards. Uh, Revelation 3 says, who is victorious? I will give them the right to sit on a throne. Speaking about the churches. And look what James says, James chapter 1, verse 12. We're going to start this in uh, our studies uh, at our home groups here at Calvary starting uh, after Easter. And um, verse 12 of James 1 says, Blessed is the one who can persevere because he will receive the crown of life. They hold these bowls, which appear to be the prayers of the saints, which are the church. And in Revelation chapter 7, those from the tribulation who come out have white robes that have been cleansed by the Lamb's blood. So there's again, those white robes again. So if you try to put a profile together of what describes the presbyteros, the elders, they're human looking, 
there's no four faces and swirling vortexes. And also if they're just these elders on these thrones, they're in white, white raiment, they have a crown on. We'll see in a moment that their crown is a Stephanos. You've heard me cover this many times the last several years. Remember the two types of crowns in the Bible? One word for crown is Stephanos, which is the wreath that you would get up at the end of the race when you compete. You would stand in front of the judge, you would lean forward, put your head down, and I would put a, a leaf a wreath over your head. And that's called a perishable Stephanos because you win that, and then a couple weeks later, it's all dried up and dead like your uh, prom corsage or your boutonniere from your wedding or something. Maybe you have it pressed somewhere, but those things don't last. He says, we're going to be given an imperishable Stephanos. And a Stephanos is presented to somebody for having run a good race, done a good job. It's a reward. That's different than the other Greek word, which is a diadema. We get our word diadem. And someone who is crowned with a diadem is a ruling king. Majesty, power, glory. We don't get diadems. We're not gods. But there are Stephanos given to us. Those from the tribulation have those white robes. And so uh, you can read about the Zoa. They're mentioned in chapter 4, 5, 7, 11, 14, and 19. And the elders are in there with them. <coughs> and I think it's always great. Every time you read about the elders, you also read about the Zoa, and they're all together doing what? Worshiping the Lord falling down, they're casting their crowns down, they're praising, saying, thou art worthy. So here's some theories that are out there. We looked at the first one. I thought I'd give you one slide that kind of breaks it out nice and clean. Um, the idea of Zacharias and the 24 courses of the priests. But again, Jesus is our only high priest. We don't have any more priests going into eternity. Uh, thankfully, you don't have to confess to anybody during eternity. Okay, go in a box and anything like that. Um, the 12 plus 12 but the question comes down to, what about their roles in the book of Revelation, though? Those are really, really different roles for the apostles and the uh, 12 tribes. In fact, the New Jerusalem has four walls, right? And there are three foundation stones in each of the walls. And whose names are on those? The 12 apostles, okay? The highest level or rank of all the Agalos, that's what some say they are. They say when you finally get around to the elders, these are super angels that are sitting on these thrones. Well, they're, not, they're never even called Agalos. Uh, they're, 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 they're supposed to be messengers, but they are called presbyteros in the Greek, which is a elder, same as the New Testament term. Um, and here's the thing that shoots down the idea that they're angels. In Revelation 7, 11, you know who's in the picture together? Angels and the elders. So um, there, there's a place where you can recognize that they are distinct. Um, some say they are redeemed saints, but the elder explains who the tribulation saints are, and they're not the elders on the throne. This is a crazy one. It's been out for about 25 or 30 years. There's some commentaries out there. Because of a couple passages that are wrongly translated about how the Lord created all the worlds, plural, it looks like in the English in some, in some translations, World means plural in the sense of all the world, everything you see. But some uh, poor translators have viewed that as all these other worlds as if there are other places besides Earth where there are beings like us who haven't fallen. I'm not making this up, okay? You might run into it. And that there's a big gathering in the book of Job of a bunch of these folks who haven't fallen with some of those who have fallen on our planet and uh, it's really a stretch to get into there, the idea that there are other planets, other solar systems, other galaxies with beings that have not fallen into sin, and they are going to be the elders sitting on the throne. Um, I'm just going to tell you, if you read about that, feel free to read about it. You can make up your own mind, but there's really no biblical support for that. Here's what I get into. The crowns are Stephanos. They're wreaths given to the victor, and they're given at the bema. Uh, when Kim and I were in Corinth several years ago, um, we actually got to see the, the bema is right there at the end of the main thoroughfare in ancient Corinth, just where the synagogue would have been, and they had their church meeting next to the synagogue. And you just picture being there with Gallos up there uh, giving his statement about how you're not supposed to preach anymore in the city. You're messing around with us Corinthians. And um, that's up at the bema. And the bema was also at the races at the track. And when someone finished the race, they would go up to the bema, and there the authorities would be on these beautiful velvet chairs or pillows. They would step forward with their stephanos. You'd lean your head forward, and they'd put it on your head as the victor. 
um, Revelation 19, 12, it's not the same thing. Jesus has a crown in Revelation 19, 12, and I spoiled it for you a couple minutes ago. What's the Greek word for his crown? It's a diadema. He's wearing the king's authority, the majesty, a diadem, as we call it in English, for rule, ruling or royalty, not a Stephanos. Jesus doesn't go in and say, I leaned my head forward and somebody gave me a Stephanos because I did a good job. Okay, no, he's, he's the ruling majesty. And then we see the term thrones, uh, thronos in the Greek. Um, and so, again, they're on these thrones. They have some form of station or office of ruling. They're wearing a Stephanos. They have white robes. And yet they fall down and worship him who's on the throne. So here's the elders in summary. They sit on thrones and rule. They wear golden Stephanos, a wreath given to a victor, which sounds a lot like a believer who's been given that at the Bema. They are Presbyterian. I mean, excuse me, they're Presbytos, okay? And uh, they are over, I just want to see who's listening, okay? Um, they're not non-denominational, okay? So they are Presbyteros. And they're overseeing ruling uh, as elders. They wear right robes. They sing a song of those who have been redeemed. Hmm. So they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That'd be a good song if somebody could write that. Well, I think they already have, right? Uh, and listen to what they say in the original Greek. You have redeemed us from among every tribe, tongue, people, or nation. And we're told that they are called kings and priests in Revelation 5.10. And they say this, you made us a kingdom of priests to God. We will rule on the earth at the second coming. So they're sounding more and more like what? Representations of people who have been saved, who have come to faith in Christ, and these elders are representative of those who've been redeemed. And they have authority. They've been given a position as a presbytero. They are elders. There were elders in the churches in the New Testament. We have elders at our church here. Um, it's a New Testament uh, doctrine to have uh, men who can rightly divide the word of God and all the, uh, the requirements for being a good um, elder. And then we see they're kings and priests. And if you go through the scriptures, there's only three places where someone is mentioned as a king and a priest. The first one in the Old Testament is Melchizedek. He's a king and he's also a priest. The second is Jesus Christ because he is after the order of Melchizedek. He's the one that fulfills what it is to be not only a king, but a priest who can go in and do intermediation on our behalf. He's also the sacrificial lamb, all in one. And the third group that are kings and priests are you and I. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 12 says, Believers are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And there's the concept that we will rule and reign in the millennium and afterwards, and we will do so alongside the Lamb. So I believe that they are representative of all who have been redeemed. They are in heaven. It's after the Harpazo, and they are up there, and John gets a chance to see it. The Harpazo has happened because we just heard what? Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, come up here. And Metatauta, after these things, I was taken up there into the great day of the Lord, and the first thing I saw was the throne, and I saw Myrias Kilios, innumerable times a thousand, every people, tongue, tribe, nation, standing before the throne. And he says, it's just uh, amazing. And then there's these elders, and just as there are elders in the New Testament church. So here's the chart I promised you, okay? So here's Isaiah on the far side, Ezekiel 1, 10, and 28 in the middle, and Revelation 4 on the far right. Three things come up. We see seraph, and the plural is seraphim. We see cherub, or cherub, or cherubim, plural. We see zoa, or zoan, are the plural. In Ezekiel, it's a man, a lion, a bull, and an eagle. In Revelation, it's a man, a lion, a calf, and an eagle. We see four living beings in Ezekiel. The throne has four living creatures in Revelation. We see in the midst of the living beings, he uses that same terminology. When he's referring back to the cherub, he says, in the midst of those living beings. And John's calling them living beings, living creatures. 
the living beings move like lightning so fast. And Revelation says uh, there are between the throne these four living creatures or living beings, and they are like bolts of thunder and lightning. So you're starting to see that uh, uh, three different views, uh, three different time periods. Uh, remember Isaiah is right around 740 B.C. Ezekiel is in the uh, probably around five. 560, 570 or so, he's about 30 years, five years into his captivity, so about 592 B.C., about 150 years after Isaiah. And John is in 93, 96 A.D., uh, almost 600 years after Ezekiel and 750 years or more, 850 years after um, Isaiah. And yet when they see heaven, they all see the same thing. And I love the fact that they didn't go into a trance and their hands started writing and the Lord just made sure everybody wrote the exact same thing. They saw what they saw. Remember, they didn't have a clipboard while they were there going, I got to get this all down. And can you guys hold still for a second with the, okay. So they wrote about it afterwards, okay. And this is how they remember it. Pretty, pretty amazing overlap. And Isaiah talks about six wings uh, with a seraph. And he says, uh, with one they covered over their eyes, with one they covered their body and the other covered down at their feet. There's uh, some biblical scholars who would talk about the fact that even as their, whatever these wings are, would cover here and would cover their feet. Um, the term in the Hebrew is the kanaf. And the kanaf is an interesting term. We'll see about it in a moment. Um, because in Revelation, we see six wings. And uh, this is called the teryx. And uh, can you think of a, uh, a term that you'd see that before, like a pterodactyl? Right? That would be like a, with some kind of big giant wings to, to spread out. And uh, think about the pterodactyl's wings. When you see the description of the wings of the living beings, it says they had the hand of a man underneath them. And so try to get away from thinking about feathers. Okay, Picture more of a giant cape or gem, some kind of a giant uh, cloak or tunic. Because the term kanaf can mean a skirt or a corner of a garment or an extremity of any kind. So the idea that they could just go like this and open up their cloaks, and it could appear to be what we would call a wing. Uh, same thing with uh, Ezekiel's term. He used the same term, kanaf, a skirt or corner, an extremity. Um, and the ophanim and the kerub, the ophanim are under the kerub, so they are in the same scene. So one is the wheels that are whirling and whirling and whirling, and the kerub are right there next to them at the seat of the throne. And we know that Satan was the anointed Karub who covers, and the Galgalim are the fiery, flaming, burning one in that wheel of the wheels. And over here, uh, a wing-like extremity, often used to actually be the wing of a bird or an eagle or something like that, because they only have really one word for something that comes out like that. But uh, perhaps it's an open, spread garment, like a cloak, a wrap, or cape-like. And perhaps what they actually saw is these these living creatures just whiffed them up like this, and it was just magnificent. And they said, oh my gosh, it looks like wings. And so again, try not to get stuck in artwork from uh, different periods where everybody's got feathers, and the only wings we can think of are bird feathers and bird wings. Um, so that gives us kind of a nice breakdown. It seems like we're looking at maybe the same things. And so then we get a chance to transport over to Acts chapter 9. One little commentary I want to make here. Um, this is covered in detail in my book, Saul of Tarsus, the Twelfth Apostle. If you haven't had a chance to get a copy of that, uh, it's available online. I can also bring some if you'd like to read through that. Uh, we have a whole section on uh, Saul's conversion as he's on the road heading toward Damascus. And, uh, but he says that he was transported in the spirit, or he says, maybe it was in the flesh. I don't really know. So thinking back on it, he literally says, I was transported well, he, he talks about it in the third person because we're going to see he doesn't want to boast about himself. But it was tangible and real to Saul. He's back at this house of Judas who lives on Straight Street in downtown Damascus. And he's in the back room and uh, he takes no food or water for three days. And he has what appears later on when they fall off, when Ananias comes and lays hands on him and prays for him, it seems like fish scales fell off his eyes. So I always like to... Um, extrapolate a little bit and embellish that I always picture that uh, Judas has this house and uh, people come by and just go, 
do you have Saul of Tarsus in one of the back rooms? And they're like, and you want to take a look? And they come over and they crack the door and here he's just sitting in the, on the bed against the wall, arms crossed, knees crossed, eyes closed. He's been there for several days, doesn't eat anything, doesn't take any water. Looks like he's got some crust over his eyes. I'm not sure what that's all about. In fact, if you read the account in Acts chapter 9, the Lord says to Ananias, um, I want you to go to a house on Straight Street, the house of Judas, and I want you to go see Saul of Tarsus. And what does Ananias say? Uh, no, because what's, what's Saul of Tarsus' reputation? Brutal. In fact, he even makes the statements. He comes here to Damascus with orders from the high priest in Jerusalem to take believers away in chains and put them in prison. And he's killed believers. And Ananias, and, and what, is, what does Jesus say? He says, Ananias, you go because he's my instrument that I'm going to use for the gospel. And Ananias, that must have been a, a tough, tough walk over to the other side of the town, right? And he comes to the door, knock, knock. Judas opens the door and he says, and this isn't Judas Iscariot or something, this is just Judas who lives there. And he says, uh, is, is Saul of Tarsus here? He goes, yeah, you want to see him? And he goes in, he lays hands on him, brother Saul. And remember, um, when the word gets out that Saul is saved, there's a lot of what? Skepticism at first. People are like going, that's almost like coming back and saying some gross guy who did uh, all kinds of mass murders or something in our, in our day and age is now a believer. And you would say to yourself, what? In fact, when he goes to Jerusalem for the first time, there's a lot of skepticism about him saying, I'm here to preach the gospel. In fact, they're so concerned about the uproar, they sent him on a ship out of Troas, out of uh, Tarshish, uh, excuse me, out of um, Tyre, and they send him up to uh, Tarsus, his, uh, his home city there in uh, Cilicia. So here's what Saul says when he writes to the Corinthians. You can just tell this is inside him. He really wants to tell people what he saw. He goes, I know a man, I know a guy, who 14 years ago was harpazo, caught up to the third heaven. Whether in body or spirit, I do not know, but he heard inexpressible words which are not permitted to be spoken. Oh, unlike John, who's writing down the Revelation, unlike Ezekiel, who writes it down, unlike Isaiah, who writes it all down, he's told no. And I love it because I believe what Jesus is saying to him is, um, that whole experience was for you and your discipleship so that you would know I'm going to be with you. And um, I'm sure there was a lot of discussion in that discipleship time outside of time space in that third heaven because he also had to convince him that... Um, Saul, I'd like to use you for ministry. And you can imagine Saul just going, yeah, I'm going to go to the Jews. I'm a Pharisee, circumcised on the eighth day, tribe of Benjamin. I, I was studied under Gamaliel. I, yeah, send me, Lord, to the Jews. Well, we're going to send you to the Greeks and uh, the Bithynians and the uh, Parthians. And, and you can just see, you must have just been like, you're going to go to Cyprus, you know, or Malta ultimately. You're going to go to Rome eventually. Um, that's why I believe the Lord gave him one little, one little nice thing to do, which is, you know, go ahead and write a treatise to your, to your wonderful nation of Israel that you love, your beloved nation, and we call it the Epistle to the Hebrews. And uh, Paul's model is what? To not boast, not recount his vision, not speak about it. Why? Well, he actually answers the question. He says, boasting may be necessary, but it's not going to be profitable. I will only boast in my weaknesses. I refrain from boasting so no one will credit me or think more of me than what he sees in me and hears from me. He's literally saying, the Lord says, everything I discipled you in the extratemporal realm during those three days, earth time, that you were in that back room, it could have felt like, what, three years. The other disciples had three year, almost three years with Jesus, fall of 29 AD till the spring of 32, about two and a half years with him, three Passovers. And he could have given Saul a really good long-term discipleship to get him ready to become an apostle. And yet, when he opens his eyes and the scales fall off, he goes, how long was I gone for? And I can imagine them just going, it's been three days. You've been sitting here for three days. And uh, I'm sure it felt like a much longer time. And this directly segues into what he calls his thorn of the flesh. That's why the thorn of the flesh, there is no way the thorn of the flesh is rickety knees or bad eyesight or arthritic hands, as some commentators have said. Number one, he boasts in his weaknesses, and he actually starts listing them. Beatings, scourgings, being in prison. I was in the water one time for an overnight and a full day and a shipwreck. I mean, he's talking about, I did all that gladly. 
What he's going to ask the Lord for is that this thorn in the flesh is actually a messenger from Satan sent to buffet me, meaning it's going to mess with its spiritual warfare. It's going to be the constant, always, challenge of his, of, of his being an apostle. They're going to say things like, well, first of all, you were never with Jesus during his time. And aren't, didn't, you kill, didn't you kill Christians? And weren't you there when Stephen was stoned and you were watching the cloaks and you were in favor of all that? I mean, that's what he had to deal with in trying to preach the gospel. Imagine if next week Tommy said, uh, you know, we have, a, um, we have a guy who was part of Pol Pot's uh, regime in Cambodia who killed, you know, upwards of four million people. He's now a believer and he's going to be here on Sunday to share the word of God. And some of you would just be like, we're having him? You know? And yet, could he be saved? Could he be, you know, in the same way? That's, how, that's what happened with Saul of Tarsus. And so, supernaturally discipled in three earth days while he sat silent in that back room. And as we close, a couple of quick things. The marriage is after the harpazo, but before the second coming. And that's what John sees. Everybody's standing there at the marriage. The bride is presented as spotless, holy, no blemish. Second Corinthians, we're going to present the bride as a virgin, Few in the churches have not defiled their garments. We see that about Sardis in Revelation 3. The supper comes after. That's after the second coming. Who gets to attend? Well, first, all those who come with the bridegroom go right into the celebration, right? After the, after the marriage in heaven, they all come now down to earth for the supper. But we see a couple of places where there will be believers from the tribulation, but they have to do what? They have to be ready with their lamps trimmed, waiting for him. Otherwise, the doors will close and they won't be allowed in. Israel, that has now embraced Mashiach, they're going to go to the marriage supper or the marriage festival. And you can read about these in Matthew 25. First, about the ten virgins at the time of the end. The groom has arrived. Come and meet with him. And some are ready and some are not as he comes back. And in Matthew 22, the wedding of the king's son. And not everybody who was supposed to be there is going to go. So what does he say? We went out to the highways and the byways, and you bring in all these Gentiles. Let them come in as well. The Bema seat, real quickly. The five crowns that we see are these rewards. These are the five we mentioned earlier in our study. And you can see where they come from in the scriptures. Uh, the crown that's imperishable, and I put a little note here. Every one of this is a Stephanos. They're all a wreath given to the victor, given to the one who has run the good race. What happens is your works get evaluated, not you as a person. You're already saved by Jesus Christ. He's taken your sin. He's become sin on your behalf. You're saved. But the Stephanos that you might receive, the rewards at the Bema, those are not for who you are as a person. That's for your service. That's for what you've done on behalf of the Lord. Chuck Missler gives this reminder Salvation is a free gift. We receive it now, right now. We don't get it later. We receive it now by faith. The awards or rewards are something that's earned. They come at a future date based on your uh, humble servant's heart to serve under the Lord. I also threw in here a Newton reminder. I meet a lot of people like this who say, well, what about the person who says, I'm just really happy to get in. Don't really need any, um, I, I'm not expecting to get anything. You know, they might give me one of those little, uh, weenie whistles, or maybe I'll get a little flashlight on a keychain or something like that, but I'm, I'm not probably going to get anything big time. That's a terrible mentality to have. Because I'll tell you right now, the guy who preaches at a church with 10,000 people coming on Sundays, like Pastor Chuck did for all those years, probably will have some reward at the Bema, but so will the gal who taught Sunday school to nine little five-year-olds, you know, gave them goldfish crackers, and they learned about Jesus, and they sang songs. And she was faithful to do that. Just like the parking attendant who served the church, just like the person who helped lead a home group, or the, some, the couple that opened up their home and showed hospitality in that way, the one who was on a prayer team, the person who found an opportunity to serve at the rescue mission one, one, one time a month or something. Think of all the opportunities where God could say, if your service is done to be seen, you don't get anything for that. That's like coming forward and saying, Hey, did you see me? And you go, yeah, everybody else did too, and you were pretty proud about that, so why don't you just move right along here? We don't have anything for you. Okay, but the person who's humble, humble in heart and so forth, the Lord says uh, there will be rewards for them. And we'll close with this. Heaven's summary. 
God's timeless realm. There are thrones in heaven. The elders are sitting on them, as well as the throne of majesty and glory and power and strength. There are seraph, Kerub, the brazen fiery ones, and the Zoa, all described the same way. Same basic description, these living beings, living creatures, moving like lightning, they have wings. Think about the term, though, again, konof and terex can also, re if I were to grab my, my cloak and go like this, up like that, and have my cloak hanging down, it would appear like wings. And so try to not always think about um, paintings that you've seen or illustrations with bird wings and feathers. The Ophanim and the, and the, are under with the Kerub. They are in the same scene. The wheel within the wheel spinning and the Kerub are there. Uh, the, and of course, uh, Satan, Satan was the Kerub who covers Lucifer. All the elders have a Stephanos and they sing about being redeemed. They certainly seem to me to be ruling with the Lord as kings and priests, representative of you and I, those who have been redeemed, every people, tribe, tongue, and nation. And finally, the setting and the backdrop in heaven is, boy, you start listing everything that's in those passages, beryl, a crystal expanse, emerald, rainbow, smoke filling the temple, flashes of light, fast-moving lightning, peals of thunder, harps, music, singing, voices. I can't wait to get to see that. I think we'll think back, we'll have our memories, of course, and we'll think back and say, I taught on this. I didn't do a very good job. Because this, this is way, way better to see it in person. Many pastors and scholars and theologians won't commit on various topics, such as the Harpazo, the Seraph, the Karub, the 24 elders, the millennium, what happens at death, extratemporal transport, when was Jesus crucified, when was he born. So for me, Rather than leave or skip or pass on these topics, my desire, I think you know, you've been coming to my studies for years now, is always to deeply examine the full biblical counsel and all the evidence about the debated topics. I also like to present the other views. You know that about me. And I do that so that you can make your own decision. You can go in the scriptures and feel like, okay, I have a pretty good feel now for what I'm looking at, and you can be rational, thoughtful in how you make your decisions. Next week... We're going to look at Jeremiah 1 through 10, Isaiah 1 through 12, and Ezekiel 1 through 10, some passages in the middle. We're going to begin now looking at God's judgment of Israel. And I do have some good news. Uh, book number four has already been printed, which is going to be shipped out um, this coming week. I think it gets shipped out on Wednesday. And then book number five I turned in last week, and that'll be here in about two weeks. And we'll have them come out at the same time because they're really tied together. Book four is what's the origin of the Bible? And book five is, is the Bible true? And it covers the main topics of reliability, credibility, infallibility, and inerrancy. And so I'm excited for those. Also 40 pages each. And thanks again to our wonderful supporters. Uh, we have about the first 350 or so that come out. We'll just give those out to the church uh, for free. You won't have to buy those. So when those come out, we'll, we'll give them out together and you'll be able to have those, okay? So let me pray for us, and we'll do some questions. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for this time together. And as always, Lord, I love being in your word. I pray that everybody who comes here would also just be so excited to look at your word. And Father, you have uh, lots of stuff in lots of different passages, and it, it's our job, Lord, to take it slow, take it one step at a time, and uh, really think it through. Uh, that's why we took four weeks to go through everything about heaven as seen by Isaiah, commented on by uh, Jeremiah, and to see what Ezekiel saw, and then to even see what John saw on Patmos, and even think about what did Saul of Tarsus see, and he wasn't even allowed to explain. He was just told, you know, you keep that to yourself, that's for you. And um, Lord, I pray that as we spend time in your word, you would just stir up in us a hunger for more, a desire to say, but I really wanna know the word better. And we would read our Bibles, uh, we would go to them constantly looking for exhortation and admonition, correction, reproof, uh, just ways to be built up. Uh, good for all kinds of instruction, Lord, and we're thankful for that. And I thank you for each person who's here this evening. I pray a blessing on them for the time they spend in the word. And um, I pray, Lord, that you'd use this to uh, grow us up to a stronger knowledge of you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Okay.